QQQM and SCHG, two of the best choices of every growth investor. And today we're going to find out who wins the battle as the best growth ETF once and for all. QQQM is the Invesco Nasdaq 100 ETF, the low cost little brother of the glorious QQQ. Equally in holdings, but with a lower expense ratio, QQQM has become the best choice for many investors that want to invest in a Nasdaq 100 index, but don't really like the idea of paying a quite high expense ratio like for QQQ. On the other side, we have SCHG, the Schwab US Large Cap Growth ETF, which with 250 holdings cover the whole growth sector and is considered one of the best growth ETFs that an investor can hold. My name is Rick, investor and Italian twin of Manu Ginobili. If you're new to the channel, say hi in the comment section below, subscribe to the channel for a lifetime access to finance and investing videos, and feel free to get all the free investing files that I created for you and that you will find for free through the link in the description below. Now we're gonna analyze and grade six different aspects of these ETFs. But before getting to the first aspect, I want to answer a question which some of you might be asking right now. Why QQQM and not QQQ? I know some of you are already wondering why we are not analyzing the great QQQ, which is the biggest growth ETF in the world per asset under management. And the reason is that QQQ and QQQM are exactly the same. But QQQM is a little bit better. Are you crazy? Is this guy crazy? That's not possible. Wait, wait, let me explain. I know someone there is already tipping in the comment section, no Rick, QQQM is not a good choice because it has a lower trading volume and therefore a higher spread. But let me explain. First of all, in case you don't know, QQQM is exactly the same as QQQ when it comes to holdings. In fact, it follows the same index and has the same performance since inception. QQQ was created in 1999 and QQQM in 2020. But the QQQM is gonna cost you less in fees, which makes it more convenient. Now, the problem with QQQM, which in reality is not a problem at all, and I'll explain why, is that because of the fact it's younger, it has a lower daily trading volume than QQQ. In other words, less people trade QQQM every day than QQQ. So the spread or difference between buy price and sell price is gonna be higher. And the truth is, this isn't really a problem. Sure, QQQ is the biggest growth ETF in the world with over 258 billions in assets under management, but even QQQM with almost $24 billion has an average spread of 0.01%. I mean, this spread is so small that buy price and sell price are basically identical. So except if you're a day trader, which I wouldn't suggest you to be, QQQM is totally fine and you're gonna save 0.05% in fees every year. Fun fact is, Invesco has to spend part of what they make from QQQ on marketing. So they need to ask you for a little more fees. With QQQM instead, they get to keep all the profit. So they're actually able to ask for less. But now let's move right to the first aspect of our comparison, which is the strategy. The Invesco QQQM tracks the 100 largest and most innovative companies listed on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange based on market capitalization, excluding financial companies. Its older brother, QQQ, has been rated as the best performing large cap growth fund on the market based on the returns of the last 15 years. And since QQQM is identical to QQQ, QQQM is also automatically the best performing large cap growth fund on the market. Information technology is the strongest sector in this ETF, financials are not included, and companies included must have a minimum average daily trading volume of 200,000 shares and have traded for at least three full calendar months. To choose the companies for QQQM, first of all, all the companies on Nasdaq are ranked by market capitalization, excluding financials. The top 75 get then selected. Any other company that was already a member of the index the year before and are still ranked within the first 100 are also selected. In the event that less than 100 holdings pass the first two criteria, the following companies in order of market cap are selected. A pretty interesting selection strategy. SCHG, on the other hand, tracks the return of the Dow Jones US large cap growth total stock market index. Inside, you'll find the 250 best and biggest growth companies within the parent index, which is the Dow Jones total stock market index. Now, to classify a stock as growth, they use six measures to projected, to current, and to historical measures. Projected price to earning ratio, projected earning growth, based on the expected three to five year annual increase, price to book ratio, dividend yield, 
trailing revenue growth and trailing earnings growth. An interesting difference between SCHG and QQQM is the way they weigh the holdings. SCHG is a pure market cap weighted ETF, namely the percentage of the single holdings depend on their market capitalization, while QQQM is a modified capitalization weighted index. This methodology allows Nasdaq to reduce the influence of the largest companies and to allow for more diversification. However, in order to make the system as similar as possible to market cap weighting, they set the rules for the rebalance. In particular, the index is to be balanced quarterly only if one company is worth 24% of the index or companies with a weighting of at least 4.5% make up 48% or more of the index. The index is also rebalanced annually, after the quarterly rebalancing, but only if one company is worth 15% of the index or the five largest companies by market capitalization have weights of 40% or more of the index. Now, both ETFs have pretty good strategies and selection criteria, but QQQ is more refined and above all, I love the fact that it's not purely market cap weighted. You notice this from the fact that even if QQQM has less holdings than SHG, the first holdings don't really have so much weight as they have in SHG. And this improves the diversification and lowers the risk a lot. For this reason, I'm gonna give here nine points to QQQM QQM and 8 points to SHG. The second aspect is the expense ratio, namely the fees that you pay on the portfolio every year. QQQM has an expense ratio of 0.15%, while SHG has an incredibly cheap 0.04%. I appreciate the fact that Invesco created QQQM with 0.15% as alternative to the more expensive QQQ but we are still far, far away from the beautifully cheap 0.04% of SHG. I know the difference doesn't seem like much, but if we test a long-term effect on nerdwallet.com, and let's say you invest $5,000 per year for 30 years at a rate of return of 6%, and you pay 0.15% expense ratio, you're gonna have paid roughly $11,500 of fees, which is 2.7% of your final portfolio amount. So you see the difference here, 0.15% yearly, but actually 2.7% of your total portfolio after 40 years. If instead you have 0.04% like SHG, the total cost of fees is roughly $3,100, which means only 0.74% of your total wealth goes away as fees after 30 years. When it comes to expense ratio, I'm gonna give you six points to QQQM and 10 points to SHG, making SHG the leader with 17 points and QQQM following with 15. The third aspect is going to be the risk. But before this, I wanna ask you a mathematical question. If the risk of subscribing to my channel is zero and the expense ratio is also zero, what is the return? Well, mathematically, since the investment is zero, the return is gonna to tend to infinity. So. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel because otherwise you're gonna lose this investment and I'm gonna be really, really sad. And I'm motivated and, and yeah, that's a really sad thing for me. But okay, let's get to the risk. QQQM has a strong overweight in information technology with 58.94%, followed by consumer discretionary with 17.9% and all the others with really low percentages. SHG instead has a sector composition that is much better distributed. 46% in information technology, 12-13% on communication, consumer discretionary and healthcare, and then down to all others. They also include financials, which are instead excluded in QQQM. And let's not forget that SCHG has 250 holdings, while QQQM only 100. If we check the sharp ratio of the two ETFs, which is a measure of risk-adjusted returns, we notice that they have a similar sharp ratio, but SCHG usually tends to be better. For this reason, but above all because of the better distribution into the sectors that I've shown you before, I consider SCHG a little less risky than QQQM. So I'm gonna give here six points to QQQM and seven points to SCHG, bringing QQQM to 21 points and SCHG to 24. Point number four is diversification. QQQM contains 101 holdings, while SHG 250. Diversification is going to be interesting to grade because I see an advantage for each one of the two ETF, depending on what you look for. For SHG, the clear diversification advantage is that it has 250 holdings instead of 100. Not much to argue about that. But the way the holdings are weighted in the index is better in QQQM. As I've showed you before, SCHG is purely market cap weighted, so if you check the main holdings, you're gonna see that Microsoft has a weight of around 12%, Apple 11, Nvidia 9%, and so on. QQQM, while having less holdings, 
still manages to reduce the weight of the top holdings. In fact, we have less than 9% for Microsoft, 8% for Apple and 6% for Nvidia and so on. So QQQM diversifies better when it comes to sector and holding weighting. But still, I have to give SCHG a little bit more for the fact that it has 250 companies instead of 100. So I'm gonna give here seven points to QQQM and eight points to SCHG, bringing QQQM to 28 and SCHG to 33. Aspect number five are the holdings. I'm gonna focus here on the top 10 holdings for both ETFs since they both cover the same sector. And as you can see in this table, the holdings included in top 10 are quite similar, with the exception of Costco for QQQM and Eli Lilly for SHG. QQQM does a much better job weighting the holdings. In fact, the top 10 have a total weight of 48% against 57% of SCHG. This is, in my opinion, an important point in favor of QQQM. So I really like the fact that QQQM, despite focusing on the 100 best companies on the Nasdaq, manages to diversify better within the holdings. For this reason, I'm gonna give here nine points to QQQM and six points to SHG, bringing QQQM to a total of 37 points and SHG to 38 points. Let's move on to the last and most important aspect, which is the performance. We're gonna analyze here past performance, but I'll also tell you what I think is gonna to happen to both ETFs in the future. In order to compare past performance, I'm gonna use QQQ instead of QQQM, because QQQM was created in 2020 and we don't have enough data. But don't worry, QQQ and QQQM are identical, so however QQQ performed in the past, QQQM would have performed in the same way. In the short term, since the beginning of 2024, SHG performed better with 12.11% against 8.09%. This makes it look like SHG is the winner, but moving to five years, you see that QQQ in the long term has been a winner. 156% against 142% in the last five years, and in the last 10 years, it hasn't been any different, with QQQ dominating with 446.9% against 337.63% of SHG. As I always say, past performance is not a guarantee of future results, but obviously it's nice to note that an ETF like QQQM or like its older twin QQQ has such a long history of wonderful results since 1999. So because of this great past performance and because I believe that QQQ and QQQM will perform better than any other growth ETF, even in the future, because of this strategy behind the index, I'm gonna give here 10 full points to QQQM and 8 to SHG, making QQQM the winner with 47 total points, followed by a really, really close SHG with 46 points. Now, what do I expect from the growth sector and these two ETFs in the future? Honestly, the current valuation and the PE ratio of the growth sector are so high that I'm afraid it's going to slow down really soon. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm expecting some really meaningful correction within the next six, seven months. But I can tell you this, fellow investors, 10 years from now and 20 years from now, I believe we will look back and say, the growth sector is still the strongest part of the market. Yes, in the long term, the very long term, from 1930 to today, value performed better than growth. That's true. But in the last 30 years, we enter a new era, the era of technology. Technology is everywhere now. Whatever sector is based on some kind of technology, if you think about it. And most of the profits of companies worldwide have to do one way or another with technology. So this makes today different from yesterday. And this is, in my opinion, the reason why, although we will still have many crashes, in the long term, the whole growth sector will keep performing better. Nevertheless, remember that an intelligent investor is an investor that understands its limits. We can talk as long as we want about what we think will happen in the future, but none of us can really predict anything. If history taught us anything, is that even the best investors made a lot of mistakes. So never lose sight of the importance of a healthy diversification between growth and value, and in the long term, you will always come out a winner. If you enjoyed this video, the best way you can help me and show me some support is by dropping a like and subscribing to the channel. So you're very welcome to do it. Thank you all for watching, guys. I wish you a great day, and as always, I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.